the team wakes up to snow. Snowstorms come in frequently from Siberia at the end of summer. Despite the cold weather, the archaeologists manage to excavate the second burial chamber. The mystery surrounding the Sergal Cemetery will finally be revealed. We've discovered a sarcophagus that has been made out of a single section of wood. This is the first time in the history of Mongolian archaeology and conservation that something like this has been found. The sarcophagus is intact and a horse is lying next to it. We're in suspense. I think we'll continue straight away, in spite of the snow. <laughs> We mustn't let any moisture in. We should cover it. What with? With a sheet? With a sheet. The sarcophagus was dug out of the trunk of a large tree. This structure seems to have withstood the mound of earth that is covering it and is in better condition than the grave next to it. The efforts of the archaeologists are finally being rewarded. The sarcophagus seems to be intact. Once the sun reappears, the team will be able to determine how much information they can gather from this site. We're going to remove some of the artifacts straight away. A small wooden horse with two small horns. Psychopomps are the creatures or deities that accompany the souls of the dead into the afterlife. In the Bronze Age, deer-like creatures represented psychopomps. However, when horses were discovered, they were considered more agile and therefore replaced deer as the symbol for a psychopomp. From then on, horses adorned with deer horns became an emblematic part of funeral ritual. Small animals were given two small horns to show they were perfect. The ceramic is broken. This is the residue that was inside it. It was inside the pot. You're a ceramic specialist, you can easily restore it. The Pazariks use mostly wooden tools, but they use ceramic utensils to cook their food. A biochemical analysis showed that this jar contained a lamb stew. The meat and fat had been cooked and then mixed with milk and vegetables. This preparation was then placed on a tray in the burial chamber to accompany the dead into the afterlife. A small bronze knife. A small knife. A small symbolic knife. Yes. These are sheep bones. This proves that they wanted to leave food with the dead so that when they came back to life, then they would have something to eat. It's amazing. It proves that they believed in the existence of another world. It's obvious. It is generally thought that the Scythian religion, or should I say the Scythian religions, are based on Indo-European theological practice with the addition of shamanic rituals and traditions. They worshipped primordial deities, heaven and earth, and their warrior god was a solar deity. Also, like the shamans, they used psychotropic substances, in particular, hashish. This fabric is extraordinary. It's huge. I think it will need to be taken to a laboratory in order to separate the different sections and restore the garment. Christoph Mullerat from the K. Bronley Museum has transported the Pazarac textiles to his laboratory. He is observing the fibers with an electron scanning microscope.
From the outset, we can identify scales. The fabric has been very well preserved in spite of the fact that it is 2,000 years old. Sheep's wool can be easily distinguished from other animal wool because it has very large scales. There's no doubt that this is sheep's wool. This wool consists of a mixture of fibers of different sizes. This is characteristic of rural animals. Christophe Moulera compares his observations with samples of contemporary wool that he collected from Kazakh sheep. It's fascinating. This sample has almost exactly the same variation of fiber sizes as the archaeological sample. Given the effort that has been made to homogenize wool fiber, it's remarkable to think that samples taken 200 years apart are so similar. Efforts have been made to eliminate large fibers because they don't take dye very well, and their size can often cause problems during the spinning process. There are two possible explanations for this lack of evolution. The extreme cold conditions mean that the region is isolated, and interbreeding between different species is therefore limited. Also, nomadic populations often breed cashmere goats. They use cashmere wool when they need fine fibers. This has been the case since the Scythian period. The Pazaric capital fabrics have a remarkable thread density, and this makes them impenetrable and therefore waterproof. We're hoping to find out more about the way in which they made these fabrics, because unfortunately, despite the number of graves that have been excavated and the number of everyday items that have been found, we have not found any weaving looms. We're hoping to find out more about the way in which the fabrics were produced. Simple technology can be used to make sophisticated fabrics. The word resilience keeps coming up. The resilience animals that were used, the materials, the techniques, the weaving, the spinning. It's extraordinary to think that these populations have used the same methods and way of handling animals for so many years. The Kazakh lifestyle seems to be an extension of the way in which the nomadic Scythians lived. This resonance confirms the resilience of the steppe civilization. The idea of combining ethnology and archaeology first came about 40, 50 years ago. Time is running out. Ethnological sources are disappearing. We're starting to see solar panels and satellite dishes on the yurts. They now have televisions. The modern world is entering the yurts and they are shifting away from tradition. The steppe civilization appeared at the beginning of the first millennium BC. It still exists, but in a different form. The present-day nomadic populations on the steppe are impoverished, and their lifestyle is far removed from the glorious days of the Scythian period. Moreover, they are endangered and threatened by the state framework that is dictated by the sedentary populations, even in countries with nomadic origins, such as Mongolia and Kazakhstan. The excavations are nearing completion. The ritual objects have been removed, and the archaeologists are now going to extract the body that rests inside the sarcophagus. Too bad, do you think that this could be a hat? A rather tall hat. A very tall hat. It's almost 50 centimeters tall, and it's beautifully decorated. It was probably only worn on ceremonial occasions. It would have been impossible to wear it in daily life. It wouldn't have been possible. It wouldn't be possible to wear a hat that's 40 or 50 centimeters tall, especially when it's windy, that's for sure. This is beautiful. It's gold. It's a woman's earring. This confirms that it's a woman. The remaining tomb had a surprise in store. 
the body of a woman is lying at the heart of the sarcophagus. She was buried with various offerings to assist her passage into the afterlife. The ceremonial clothing and gold jewelry indicates that in addition to her role as a wife and mother, she held an important position in the social hierarchy of the clan. The place of women in Scythian culture was different from their role in sedentary civilizations at that time. Women held a high status and often had important political roles. Women were leaders of tribes and queens of entire clans. They had weapons and, it's more than likely, that they fought in battles. She seems to have been injured by a blunt instrument that was destined to kill her. It looks as if it was forced into her skull. It's interesting. A collection of wounds has been made by a stabbing action. This part in particular is interesting. The wounds form a quadrangle. It's clear that she had already been injured when she was killed because she has old wounds. Her injuries seem to suggest that she was killed in battle and that her death was a prolonged affair. These warlike nomadic women make me think of the Amazons in Greek mythology. It seems that in the 6th and 5th centuries BC, the Greeks based their mythical women on the Scythian warrior women. Studies suggest that Scythian women were equal to men and that they had the same rights. They rode horses, they hunted, and they fought in wars. The mythology of Amazons can be linked to the historical reality of these warriors. They were different to the submissive women in Greece at that time. Hercules, Achilles, Theseus. The Greek heroes fought the Amazons and attacked the real-life image of the emancipated women Scythians. We will ask an anthropologist to analyze whether she is of Caucasian origin, like the other members of the Paziric population. The first generation was Caucasian, and the population then interbred, and their children were half Caucasian and half Mongolian. We're going to do DNA tests. Is there a genetic link between this woman and the man and child from the neighboring grave? DNA samples from three bodies were sent to Professor Krubesi's laboratory. The results were unexpected and shed new light on the clan. The results are interesting. The man and the woman are not the parents of the little girl. The woman and child have a slight genetic link. This suggests that they were distant relatives. This helps us to have a better understanding of the Altai populations. The woman and the child were of European origin, and the man was of Asian origin. During the Iron Age, the Asian and European populations became increasingly blended. It is believed that this happened gradually over time. There were many territorial battles during this period. It is thought that invasions and battles played a key role in the shift towards a non-European culture, imbued with Asian elements and defined by the human contact with other civilizations. We noticed straight away that the two tombs had been placed very close to each other. Yes, they're touching. This doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that they lived alongside each other. Tombs are usually separated from each other. Yes, by at least one, two or three meters. These twin tombs in Sergal are linked for eternity. Their hidden treasures have been revealed, yet the precise nature of the relationship that united these three individuals remains a mystery. Did they belong to the same clan? Had they formed a family? Why have their graves been placed in a way that breaks with tradition? Where the archeological research ends, it's up to our imagination to take over. These are the last known burial sites that can shed light on the Pazric culture. 
At the end of the third century BC, groups of people from the east put an end to the Scythian domination on the Altai Mountains. The survivors were assimilated by the Mongolian invaders and forced westward. This movement gave rise to the barbarian invasions in the west and the fall of the Roman Empire. Successive nomadic populations have carried the steppe civilization and culture forward to the present day. The Scythian culture still survives, but its future now seems inexorably threatened.